Hey Tall Skulls, Nick here. Sorry to have to do this again, but it's Omen's fault this time. So, there's that. So, Omen's recording was not up to wonderful standards, and he's got some feedback and some fuzz and some white noise. I've done my best to edit it out and put silence in where it, it's supposed to be, but there's always going to be a little bit of fuzz in his speech for this episode. So please bear with us. We're going to address it. We're going to make it better. You shouldn't have to listen to fuzz. We're better than that. And you deserve better. So thank you for sticking with us. Enjoy. Talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, armor up with your noise-canceling headphones, fight your way to work like a salmon swimming upstream, and reject the flawed premise of Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. Because it's time to talk tall to me. This is Talk Tall to Me. I am Nick McGill. And I am Omen Said. We are your co-conductors on this regional transport through the badlands of Jethro Tull. We have little bottles of water, and we have spy glasses to see the passing environments as we whip through. Station by station, kilometer by kilometer, we chug our way through the countryside, which is the complete discography of prog rock band Jethro Tull. And today we have reached a fairly epic station. Yes, we have. Today is going to be a bit of a beefcake, I must say. Nick, on a scale of one to have to change your pants, how intimidated are you right now? You know, honestly, it's I'm not that intimidated because it's so well documented. I just am feeling, I'm feeling the pressure of talking about this song. There is a lot. I, I will grant you that. There is a lot to, to address and discuss. But honestly, like I said, it's because it's so well documented and people come to us as the leading experts in Jethro Tull, I... <laughs> what we say is canon, Omen. <laughs> we might get fired out of a canon. <laughs> Well, I, I hope I hope to be successful in talking about this, Nick, and with you there to help me, then I probably will be successful. What are we listening to today, Nick? Today is the monumental moment that we've all been waiting for. We are listening to Locomotive Breath. <laughs> <laughs> wow um nick do we have any housekeeping or should we just um tie ourselves straight to these train tracks oh uh, let's buckle right in i i think this is we've got so much going on that all right yeah let's let's dive right in shovel some more coal on the fire and let's have a listen brace yourself And there we have it. Okay, before we get into what is, what has a significant amount to unpack. Yes. Omen, how do you feel about Locomotive Breath? How do I feel about it? How do you like this song? Hmm. You know, it's one of those, it's one of those songs that I get excited about when I first hear it. And then by the end of it, I'm sort of like, oh, I kind of wish it was Bungle in the Jungle. <laughs> you know, I, yes, there, there's perfect. so many other songs where I'm like, where, where, that I'm actually excited about. I do yeah. like this song, but it's not, for me, it's it's nowhere near my, on the top of my favorites list of Jethro yeah. Tull. Agreed. I think it's a really awesome song. I think it's a, it's a bop. I think that mm -hmm. it, there's a... There's a reason that it has popular appeal. Uh huh. It's jammy. It's a jammy dodger. You can dunk it in your tea. Yep. I would. I would. I have. I am right now. And 
yeah, it's not my favorite, but I, but I but I like it, and I and I and I appreciate why a lot of other people like it. Okay, that's 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 pretty spot on to to how I feel about it too. We feel we feel similarly about it. We we concur. We are of one brain. In this, at least. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't. It just it lacks it lacks something for me. I suppose. Can you tell me how many times this has been played in concert, Nick? Oh, yep. I have it pulled up. Yeah. By 35 artists. Wow. It has been played 2,614 times. (laughs) Oh, my God. Wow. First played January 15th, 1971. Literally 30 seconds after they finished recording. (laughs) They stepped right out on stage. Jethro Tull at Tivoli, Copenhagen, Denmark. Hmm. The most recent play was December 19th, which was two days ago as of recording, 2019, by Martin Barr at the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center, Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Are you kidding? No, I am not. Nick, can I tell you something fantastic? I would love for you to. I'm so excited right now. Martin Barr and I have performed on the same stage. Oh, that's pretty cool. Not at the same time. Oh. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've, I've performed at the at the Catherine Hepburn Memorial yeah. Concert Hall. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful theater. Yeah, the uh, a lot of the theaters in Connecticut have have fortunately had a lot of patrons to keep them really kind of in good working order. Right. And they've been they've been well preserved. Only one of them had Miss Catherine Hepburn herself as its guardian angel. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh that's a lot that's a lot of that's a lot of stage time for this song. Yep, just some some notable things. It wasn't played at all in 83, it looks like. No, 84. I don't know, there's a chunk in like 80 83 where it wasn't played at all. And it was only played once in 85. But it was played for six months straight in, in one stretch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and some, some noted some noted players. Yeah. Tull obviously takes the top, followed by Ian Anderson, followed by Martin Barr. Right. Jump down a couple of spots. Joe Bonamassa. Oh. John Bonham's son, clearly, to, to reference back to our interview podcast. Let's see. Government Mule. Huh. Clive Bunker is credited for once. Wow. Les Claypool credited for once. Wow. Mother Goose credited for once. That's that Australian band with the funny costumes, isn't it? Yeah. Were they a tall cover band or they were just a funny? Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, No, I think they were just a funny bunch of weirdos. Yeah. Funny bunch of weirdos. Uh, That's the other name of their band, actually. And then uh, Dee Palmer is also credited for playing it. Once. Fantastic. So yep. popular uh, amongst other musicians, probably partly just due to its its recognizability. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, you don't hear you wouldn't you wouldn't go on stage and be like, and now tribute. We're gonna pay tribute to Jethro Tull by playing Budapest. Yeah, that you yeah. would be booed off stage. Yeah. Yeah. Or they'd be saying Budapest. Do the sensitive mandolin part. <laughs> just weeping, just, just <laughs> weeping throughout the audience. So, Nick, as we promised, we we should we should talk a little bit about the recording process for this song. Yeah, it was a bit. It was a bit unusual. It was. It was like we said last week. They. This was one of the songs where they did not come into the studio ready to go. This right. was this was a brainchild of Ian Anderson, and he kind of had to get the rest of the band on board. Right, and the first way that he tried to do that was was to just get everyone in the room and be like, "I have this idea for a song. It should sound like this. Let's do it. Let's go." Yeah, but it it didn't it didn't take. There wasn't there wasn't a synergy. Did not work. The anecdote that I heard is he could not get across to them. Pick this pace and stick with it. They always picked up speed. Hmm. And he didn't want that. He wanted it to to just chug. That's funny. Just go along. 
and for some reason they just they just couldn't I... couldn't f- keep that one steady pace which seems peculiar for musicians I just had like a really dumb mental image of him being like yeah it's a, this song about a train and then being you know then playing a rhythm like in the shuffling madness like a, a nice light light do, jazz do, number do, do, do. yeah bow, bow. yeah like a swing yeah so so ultimately what happened was and and you'll hear this in the interview that that we talked about last week of course they didn't have click tracks back in those days which yeah which is a track you put in your earphones which is essentially gives you a metronome so ian went in and by himself recorded the bass drum and the hi-hat part yeah just jammed that out and then went back over it and laid down some electric guitar. This was the ultimate layer, seven layer dip of songs. He built up three or four layers before they brought in John Evan for piano. Right. And then right. they brought in Clive Bunker to do drums, all in separate pieces, all pieced together. Yeah. And somehow it worked. I think that. They are obviously all musicians of, of great skill. Uh-huh. I think they got really lucky. I'm inclined to agree, yeah. Absolutely. I think that one one espresso fewers or, or one mo- more hour of sleep from any of them, and we would never have known Locomotive Breath. Right. Could have been scrapped. Or it could have been just one of those songs that they played for the album and never play again but somehow it, and it stuck won't stop going nowhere to slow down. Uh, uh, uh. somehow they they all worked it out and and it it not only became one of their most recognizable but one of their most played songs live or or otherwise wow amazing a frankenstein in vitro fertilized monster of a song somehow went on to to perform at the Ritz. A long and successful life <laughs> yeah yeah it's 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 really fascinating to hear that story because you, you'd never know you'd never know something like that you know no absolutely not every time i've ever heard this song i just imagine all of them like rocking out like in pure sync with each other just like locking gazes hair flying pelvises thrust forward just like in one single take. Like they would be doing it on stage. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I believe that's what the interviewer said too, is that it sounds like a live track. Right, 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 right. And Ian's like, whoa, that's quite lucky because we had to play it quite a lot of times. Yeah. Not that I'm bitter about it. I don't, I don't hate this child of my song. <laughs> so despite working presumably a ton on this song yeah despite the technical challenges of the studio despite working in an old freaking church this song sounds pretty darn perfect and that's the mark of true professionals isn't it you know you you make it seem effortless you hide all the seams yeah make it seem like just a oh yeah this is this casual thing that we popped off because we're brilliant right you don't smell all the angst and, and tears and sweat and frustration behind it. Yeah, what what gets you more credit? A perfectly precise song and everyone thinks you just you just knocked it out or a perfectly precise song and you said, "Oh yeah, we worked our asses off for this." You know what gets you the most credit? Having an entire podcast dedicated to your work. Oh, there it is. There it is. You're welcome, Ian. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Finally, you've made it. <laughs> Can we talk about the piano part on this? The yeah. John Evan. John Evan's wonderful. Like kind of jazzy, bluesy number to, to get us into it. It's funny that it kind of comes back to the blues for this intro. Yeah. It feels like they've been going away from the blues for this whole album. And now here right at the end, there is a little bit of a return to the blues, especially with the piano, at least. Yeah. Every now and then we get a little glimpse of it. We get a touch of it. But this is a this is a, a heartier glimpse than we've had in a in a while. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fun. It's funky and it's 
I could see the song being fine without it, but it's a nice little work into it. It it it, it gets you started. I think the song would lose a lot of its longevity without without the piano and you without so? that intro. I do because it's it would just be it would just be like a piece of roast beef on a plate, and this is a piece of roast beef on a plate with a delightfully provocative fruit sauce glaze as contrast. Okay. It's not like some kind of exotic fruit sauce. It's not persimmon. It's raspberry. Yeah, it's raspberry. It's okay. not cloudberry and star fruit. Yes. It adds to it. It doesn't make it unpalatable if it's gone. Mm, mm-hmm. It just adds it adds more flavor. It adds a little more depth to it. I get it. It makes it more memorable, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, th- I think it could be more more dismissible if it didn't have that. Yes, I agree. And even with that that little, I don't know, what, 15, 20 seconds of, of piano noodling in the beginning, the song itself is only four minutes and 23 seconds. Yeah, when we were just listening to it and it started to wind down, I was like, oh, it's, a, it's over? I always thought this song was a lot longer. I think I put this and Aqualung at about the same length, but that's not true. You know, this song feels longer when you're doing it as a karaoke piece. Yeah, it does. Feels very long. But Bungle in the Jungle is a breeze. Which is longer. I believe so. Those really are the only two karaoke songs to do as Jethro Tull because rarely does the book have anything else. <laughs> right. It may have Aqualung, but that's a... Oof. That's, that's, oh, yeah. That's hefty. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have ever done Jethro Tull at a karaoke bar. Oh, I see you. Yep. I see you. I'm not alone. Wonderful. Yep. Okay, you can put your hands down. (laughs) Nick, let's talk about the flute solo. Yeah, okay. On a scale of huh to woo, where is it? I would go to woohoo for sure. Okay. Yeah. Very generous of you. I don't hate this flute solo. Am I supposed to? Am I supposed to huh? This fruits, flute solo? No, I'm not saying you should hunt it. I, I would personally would give it more of a, huh. Oh. Okay. No, I think it's, I think it's fun. I think for, <laughs> no, knowing the, the story behind this song, Ian was probably exhausted and just mm. like, just phoned it in. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do this on the flute gun. I mean, fortunately for the song, Ian Anderson phoning something in is like is like anyone else working for six months and then yeah. getting the most passionate performance of their life. Right. It's still it's still really freaking solid. Yeah. It's not my favorite flute solo. No. Even on the album. No. No. I totally agreed. It doesn't have a, a lot of subtlety. But it, it passes for sure. Oh, it's yeah, and, and yeah. it's appropriate to the song. It's high energy. It's an oral break to to break up the heavy guitar and drums and and you know it it it's. It's so Ian can step forward on the stage a little bit further and do his thing. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It it is does what it's labeled on the tin. What's the fr- what's the phrase? John oh. J- John Ang- Anglo correspondent John. It's a Britishism. Tell what is it? It's what are you talking about, Nick? Do you know where you are, Nick? How many <laughs> how many fingers am I holding up? Jethro Tull fingers. <laughs> this song came out as a single. Yes, it did. Its B-side had Wind Up and Fat Man. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, which I think is why Fat Man is actually one of the bonus tracks. Ah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And it hit 59 on Billboard, I believe. Was that in America or in in Britland? Mm, Britland? I believe Billboard is United States. We certainly have billboards here. The billboard charts tabulate the relative weekly popularity of songs and albums in the United States and elsewhere. So, (laughs) yeah. Great. Great. Thanks. Yeah. It was also released as the B-side to a Hymn 43 single. How fascinating. Yeah. You know what I think is really successful musically about this song? What's that? The unsung hero of this song, as it will is the muted guitar strum yep the in the main riff yeah 
I think it gives the listener a resting place for a second. Yeah, it, it's a safe spot. And builds the tension simultaneously. And also, in just mechanically, it it kind of keeps that pace. It reminds you and probably everybody else playing the music that this is our pace. And it sounds like a train. Yeah. Thank you, Ringo. Thanks, thanks, Ringo. Who let? Did you let him in? Did you give him a key to the studio? So sorry. I'm really. He should. Um, Ringo? No, no, no. You, there's. Go back to the candy room. Back to the candy room, Ringo. I just. I just think he's lonely. I feel kind of bad. We gave him a kitten. Did, I, I haven't seen that kitten in a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What do we have anything else musically that we want to address about this song? Um No. No, I don't mm. think so. I don't think so. I think we can okay. I think we can get into content now. Let's get into content. Nick. So I just I just want to I just want to go back. I think it was 2 weeks ago. Okay. I got excited and I misspoke a little bit. I said this song was about climate change. It's not It's not. It's about population growth. Those things are not unrelated. Not unrelated, for sure. They are, maybe I will say, interrelated. Yes, but it has been stated by Ian Anderson that specifically this is population growth. Shall we hear a quote from Ian Anderson? Yeah, I think I think the, the more primary resources we can use in our thesis paper, the better. Thank you, Dr. Nerdstein. <laughs> 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 so this is a an excerpt from the 2013 interview with Ian Anderson that he gave to songfacts.com. When I wrote it, I wasn't deliberately setting out to write a piece of music on a particular subject, but it evolved during the writing process into being not terribly specific, but about the issues of overcrowding, the rather claustrophobic feel a lot of people get in a limited space and the idea of the incessant, unstoppable locomotive being a metaphor for seemingly the unstoppable population expansion on planet Earth. When I look at it today, it does, for me, become very crystallized in being a song about unmanageable population expansion. It's something that concerns me even more today than it did back then when I wrote it, when the population of planet Earth was only about two-thirds of what it is today. So in my lifetime alone, we've seen an enormous increase in population, and an enormous increase in the degree to which we devour our limited resources. So, the idea of population planning and management is something that I think we ought to be thinking about a lot more than we do. Does it mean I think we should sterilize everybody after the age of 30? No, of course not. The size of the family you want is going to have to be your choice, but... You should make that choice knowingly, wisely, and responsibly. This is Ian Anderson. Please remember to spay and neuter your family members. Children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and just a, a little bit from uh, Wikipedia as well. I've heard of that. Uh, yeah, I just started it actually a couple of months ago. <laughs> Quote, <laughs> You'd think population growth would have brought prosperity, happiness, food, and a reasonable spread of wealth, but quite the opposite has happened, Mm. and is happening even more to this day. Without putting it into too much literal detail, that was what lay behind that song. There you are. Yeah. And just a a reference to trains, because this this is not... This may be the first, but is not the last train reference we get from Ian Anderson. Oh, certainly not the last. One of my favorite songs that I'm excited to do in about three years is about train. <laughs> it's uh, Dogs in Midwinter. No. Nope. Quote, train songs have been with us ever since the blues began, and I've written my yeah. fair share of these. I keep being drawn back to the subject because public transport is part of my life. Hmm. I don't drive, so rely on buses, trains, and the like. Huh. So it's just it's just in his in his zeitgeist, his personal zeitgeist. It's not even the first train song on this album. Yeah, fair enough. Good point. <laughs> so that leaves us little room for speculation. But I am curious, Nick. Yeah, right. Regardless, you know, because we didn't we we didn't do these 
we didn't look at these interviews when we were 15, 16 years old and listening to this song. Yeah. So when you first heard this song, the first t- couple of times that you heard it, what did it make you think of? What did it make you feel? That... That's it's a... about trains. Thank you, Ringo. Thank you, Ringo. Cool. Gosh, I, 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 I forgot to, I forgot to refill his water bowl. The, 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 the child gate has a lock for that side. I, he shouldn't be able to get in. I don't know how he does it. Make sure there aren't any any paper clips in his room. Oh, that was it. That's it. Honestly, I I didn't give it much thought. Okay. Because I was never really super drawn to this song i never really Mm -hmm. took the time to sit down and really think about it i think Mm. that being said i just wanted to throw in there i keep forgetting this is the song that when my dad would play soccer games in college this is the song he listened to in the locker room beforehand to get pumped that's hilarious isn't that crazy that's amazing and and i and i can totally see why it is it's got that kind of a feeling to it. Yeah. Yeah, there's it's just a it's just a manic solid ever moving energy. You know, for me it, it always gave me it always gave me the feeling of the struggle against inevitable defeat. Okay. But the the kind of glory in a way of like going out against insurmountable odds and knowing that you're going to be crushed by this this incredible force and knowing that you're the loser and knowing that you're to expand upon a metaphor from the song balls are in a vice and knowing that you have no other choice but to go out there and and saying to yourself well i'm gonna go out there and i'm gonna try so it's 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 the act the glory is in the act even more so than in the result Definitely, yeah. Okay. It's knowing that you're going to fail and going out there, the guns blazing with your head held high. Did you ever see the most recent Mad Max film? I did not. There is the 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 disposable peons of the bad guy. I forget what they're called, but they, it's it's basically just like a, a wild post-apocalyptic cult. And they, they, they have this thing where they, they basically kamikaze, they'll suicide to, to prove themselves and, and for the, the betterment of their, their, their cult. But they do, they, they always say something and it's witness me. And they say that to their, their brethren around them as they run off and like ram their car into the guy they're chasing to blow it and them up. Wow! So w- witness my sacrifice, basically. It also reminds me of sort of the the other side of that, when the Roman emperors and and higher ups would attend the gladi- the gladiatorial matches. Uh huh. Rumor has it they would say, "To those about to die, we salute." We salute you. you. Yeah. It sort of has that feeling to it. If like, yep, I'm gonna go out and go to school again and just be crushed under the unrelenting force of social conditions that make me not popular because that's my experience and blah <laughs> yeah. blah blah yeah that you know this is like when i was listening to it being 15 this is this is what i was was going through my head it was like i'm gonna go out and get rejected by every girl that i have a crush on because i am a weirdo and no one wants to be seen <laughs> dating me but i'm gonna go out and give it my best try yeah that can be interpreted in many many ways <laughs> The song or what? That idea in the song or that you're, you're getting from the song. Yeah. There are some specific things which, which puzzle me. Before we actually get into it, yeah. there's also, I don't know, I'm not a big Stephen King reader. My lovely wife is, and I forgive her for that. But there's, in the, in the Gunslinger series, okay. there is, it's in the, the book's, the Wastelands and Wizard and Glass, there is a train with an artificial intelligence that is basically just nonstop running around. And he 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 went the the artificial intelligence went insane as the world went into decline. Huh. And the whole premise 
one of the main premises of of the series is that this is somehow like a post apocalyptic uh, alternate universe, but it it also connects to present day our world. Hmm. So this train in this alternate universe is somehow related to a children's book called Charlie the Choo Choo. Oh. And there are a lot of similarities between like the nonstop. Do you think that Stephen King I I don't know. Because we have the name Charlie in this song. Yeah, I know. I know. I don't know. I, I think I tried to research it when I did listen to the audiobooks. I thought, holy cow, this sounds really, really like it's got to be based off of this. But I don't think I ever found any. Your your research was interrupted by the FBI showing up and tearing the Internet out of your house. <laughs> because I, I was on to Too something. Too close to the truth. Too deep, too deep. Forget this ever happened. Yeah, that I think that's what it was. Yeah. That being said, no, I I'm, I don't think it it must just be because because Charlie and Choo Choo work together. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. you know I don't know. I don't think it's anything more than that. But that being said, I never I never knew the the real story behind this song and. When Ian says, without getting too blatant, that's the story behind this song, yeah. like, I think he could have been a little more with, blatant. With, <laughs> without being blatant at all or giving any clue to this being what I mean, Yeah, I'm going to be so not heavy-handed that, in fact, I have no hands. Light, lightly handless. Lightly handless. So the, the, the lyric that's always sort of puzzled me is, at the end, and the all-time winner has got him by the balls. He picks up Gideon's Bible, open at page one. I thank God he stole the handle, and this train, it won't stop going. No way to slow down. And the all-time winner has got him by the balls. Oh, he picks up Gideon's Bible. Just the introduction of Gideon's Bible open at page one. Should we unpack that Mm -hmm. a little bit? Yeah, I have a theory, but let's let's go let's go piece by piece. Well, first, what's what's Gideon's Bible? Gideon's Bible. All that I know about it is that isn't that what you find in a hotel room? Is that a it's a specific? It's like the King James Bible. Yes, I don't I don't know if it refers to the translation or if it refers to. The group of people who go around putting these Bibles in hotel rooms, the Gideons, I think. Oh, the Gideons International. Yeah. Right, but there's, and I, I there was a, there's a very specific history about it. It started at a, at a certain point in the past century where this group decided, you know what, we're going to put a Bible in every single hotel room in America. Yeah. Which is pretty crazy if you think about it. The Gideons' primary activity is distributing copies of the Bible free of charge. Right. So in terms of the spread of religion, we have (laughs) Gutenberg and then the Gideons to blame. Tune in to our next episode of Gripe Gideons to me. So So there are certain things that this implies. That implies that we could imagine that this person is in a hotel room. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, to me, speaks to the the kind of touring nature of of Anderson's life. Sure. Or just a sense of movement. Yeah. And I wonder, just just like, just having read it again, it makes me think, is the the central figure of the loser, as it were, picking up this this book to the very first page of the Bible, which in this Judeo-Christian context is the book of answers, the book of all things, right? And on the first page discovers that God has torn the handle off of this train and there's no way it can stop. Huh. That sort of that's the first rule of existence in this in this con in the world of this song. So we despite what we've been led to think we have no control. Because God had that control and he just 
he he broke it he he turned that dial up to 11 and broke it off yeah exactly exactly and so the premise of existence itself is you don't have control and the train is rushing somewhere possibly quite dangerous yeah a part of me wants to say it's see it's hard it's hard to come up with our kind of off the cuff ideas because we know what this song is about I know. I almost wish that we could drink forget all juice and talk about this song before we looked up the information about it. You drank a lot of that in college, didn't you? I in what? <laughs> <laughs> to me it it almost sounds like the the Gideon's Bible references is, is more broadly a Christianity because it ties in with the God thing and that that Christianity is that train that has that we have no control over and is just plowing through. Well, and if you want to tie it back into itself, don't you think that some of the problem of overpopulation comes back to religious beliefs? Yeah, sure go do. Go forth and prosper, yep. go forth and procreate. We also have science to blame for a lot of that, to be honest. Freaking science, I know. Without the without the uh, discovery of penicillin, the population probably would not have exploded. Yeah, as much as it did otherwise. Yeah, and just keep adding medication and 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 medical breakthroughs on top of that. You know, life expectancy from right. from three generations ago is is significantly improved. But do you think that that would have happened in the same way without the without the kind of religious injunction to have as many children as possible? I, I'm sure that certainly had something to do with it. Yeah. You know, whether it was squirt out a bunch of kids because you need them on the farm or. Right. We need more Catholics than we need pagans, mm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the, the more, the more boots we have to stamp out the, those, those dirty hippies all the better. Right. And even today, the, those who don't practice contraception and 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 try to have as many kids as possible and and or 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 trust it to god you know well right. we'll just if if we have more kids we have more kids because that's what he wanted right 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 right, right. yeah it's it's that that level of of disconnect and naivete that that has has kind of gotten us to where we are Although I do, I do certainly think that in our country and in a lot of highly industrialized countries, the old belief or the old reality, perhaps, of more children equals more prosperity for your family is, is no longer the case and no longer really believed in. You know, there oh, was yeah. a time that if you had more kids, great, you could be more productive and you could do better for your family as a whole. Yeah, even between our parents to our generation. You know, boomers, oh, boomers had two to two to five kids and most of our generation has one. I've got negative. children. You have negative children. You've killed so many children. Oh, my. To... I don't I... <laughs> for the good of the planet. How okay, wait, you fed so many children to Ringo for the good of the planet. <laughs> Is that better? Great. <laughs> All right, little baby Thanos over here. <laughs> who? How many? How many? Uh, how many siblings do your parents have? Oh gosh, my mother has three or four siblings. So she's one of one of four. Or one five. of four. I think it was four, and that seems small or no, moderately sized for boomers. My dad is one of six. I think. Wow. Yeah, his parents highly Catholic. Contagiously mm. Catholic. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Volatily Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. Infectiously Catholic. Did you already say that? You said contagious. Contagious. My my dad was one of three, is one of three, and my mom is one of seven. Your parents are a generation older than my parents. Not a, a full pretty generation. darn close. My mom, my mom is definitely a boomer. My dad is in um, a peculiar category in that he is ageless, older than the earth itself. <laughs> that is, that man is made of dirt. 
dirt and spit. Yeah, his, his <laughs> brothers his brothers were Sauron and, uh, and the and the moon. <laughs> Well, that was good. uh, That was good. So, what else do we have to talk about about this song, Nick? Do we do we want to get into any real lyrical analysis? It's hard because because anything that we can anything that we can talk about has already been sort of given to us. I don't think this warrants breaking down by stanza. No. I think it would be just seeing how these fit into the premise that has already been given to us via and, Ian Anderson. And I think that it does it does pretty well. You know, he still he sees his children jumping off the stations one by one. You know, you have this sense of going through life and just throwing your progeny out into the world to keep procreating. Yeah. Oh, even even it makes me think of the all time winner has got him by the balls. The all time winner is is the advance of society and the advance of population and it's got him by the balls because of that's some of where children come from. That's where some children come from. At least fifty percent. <laughs> that's how it works, Nick. I, that's science. I know I have a I have a, a doll here. Scientific I what? what? So, Nick. <laughs> yes, Omen. Yeah. Gosh darn it, Omen. Next week mm. is our final week for Aqualung. Wind up. Oh, that's right, because we're not doing the bonus tracks because we're going to do them later. Is that correct? Yeah, they're, they're just bonus tracks that happen to fall from other albums. There's like Lick Your Fingers Clean for some reason, and that's on War Child fat man which we saw earlier so delightful so so this is our penultimate aqualung podcast that's right episode that's right join us next week for wind up Uh uh-huh and in the meantime as the inevitable crushing train of our success bears down on you you can accept its movement by giving it five stars just embrace it, go with the flow, get everybody else on this train. It's going to happen eventually. You might as well yeah. expedite the process. I quite like trains. <laughs> I, write a, I write a lot of songs about trains because I ride them. Is that, is that right, Ringo? <laughs> I ride them regularly. And that's, that's why you have a song about trains. Yes. And is that why you have a song about toast? I eat toast on trains. I toast. ride toast every morning. <laughs> I do get crumbs in my bum. <laughs> bum crumbs. That's the chorus. That's <laughs> that's the title of my next album. Oh, oh goodness. <clears throat> <laughs> so that is it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. As usual, I am Nick McGill. I am Omen Said. We are Feckless Momes. And this is Talk Tall to Me. Steam breaking on his brow. Talk Tell to Me is a proud member of the Feckless Moans Audio Network. Oh, Charlie stole the handle. Is that how you wanted it, Ian? Ian, was that good? Is that what you had in mind? That was really groovy. Yes, I think we've got it. I think we can call it a day. Let's go down to the pub and have a pint, celebrate our great success. It's going to be just like that on the album.